Hi folks. Uh, well, people have been asking about how and why I was recently unlawfully jailed and what's happened to our uh, recent Supreme Court applications detailing uh, a range of criminal activity ongoing uh, by the DPP's office and in the courts. Well, here are the facts, the very disturbing facts. In 2015, we had discovered that the banks, that's our publicly owned banks, were unlawfully repossessing hundreds of family homes and paying commissions to county registrars. So we went to Castlebar Courthouse to lawfully protest. The guards were called, people got injured, and all of our subsequent complaints to the statutory authorities were completely ignored. But by then we had discovered the power of private prosecution by common informer where any ordinary member of the public can go straight into a district court and lodge a criminal complaint. So that's what we did. We accused County Registrar Finton Murphy and Garda Sergeant Peter Hans Hanley for criminal assaults and got summonses for them to attend court. Now this in a nutshell is what this whole sorry saga is all about, including my recent false imprisonment and the rejection of numerous applications to the courts. It is about the desperation of the establishment, or at least those rogue elements within it, to prevent, at any cost, the exposure of the casual, rampant criminality, the misconduct and corruption that permeates our so-called justice system, and most especially within our courts. On September the 2nd, 2015, Colin Granahan and myself, acting as lay prosecutors, were waiting in court along with a group of supporters for Finton Murphy and Sergeant Peter Hanley to arrive to face the charges against them. But they did not turn up, and Judge Kevin Kilrain, the very same judge who issued the summonses, refused to order bench warrants for their arrest. Naturally, the public got enraged and started calling out for him to leave the, leave the bench in shame and dishonour, and eventually Kevin Kilrain abandoned the courtroom. In the meantime, I had lodged four more summonses against Dublin Gardaí for another serious assault, and this was getting some traction in the media, despite the system's best efforts to keep things under wraps. You cannot find any official records for these cases, for example, even though there have been over a dozen hearings so far. Now, we'll come back to those prosecutions in a minute, but first of all, it's important to note that we had also started a pro-justice and anti-corruption campaign leading up to the general election in Endicenny's own backyard, where we were highlighting political and judicial misconduct, and no doubt, just as with the recent Jobstown trials, someone in authority decided that this type of public dissent and open questioning of the authorities simply had to be quashed. So, nine months later, Colm and I received backdated summonses charging us with Section 6 public order offences and we were ordered to appear on June the 1st, 2016. I asked Judge Devins if I was safe from assault in her court. She refused to answer and just walked out. Two weeks later, I asked Judge John Lindsay the same question. He shouted and threatened me with jail, whereupon a group of Gardaí again escorted me out. Colm and I were bewildered and confused. What on earth was going on here? Then we got to see the witness statements against us, all from members of the establishment or by people paid by the state. And we had our first good laugh. Because some of the statements were so childishly contrived and exaggerated that they could easily be disproven as fabrications. What we didn't know then, though, was that sinister plans were already afoot to make sure that this particular trial would head in only one direction. And if a few rules, laws, or articles of the Constitution had to be bent or broken in the process, or if some evidence needed to be fabricated or erased, well, so be it. Mayo State Prosecutor Vincent Dean was assigned to prosecute, and the inscrutable Judge Anus McCarthy was specially brought in from Limerick to oversee the trial. Now, what followed was such a disgraceful parody of a trial as to beggar belief. First of all, no one can be tried without legal representation unless they opt to defend themselves. Under EU and international human rights law, it is the state's obligation to provide effective legal representation. But Anus McCarthy decided otherwise and commenced with the trial regardless. We were dumbfounded. We told him that this was, uncom this was completely unlawful, but McCarthy just ignored us. When we told him that the state was withholding key evidence from us, 
such as our Garda records and even our own case files. But that didn't faze McCarthy either. Then we discovered that the lead witness, Castlebar Court Service Manager Peter Mooney, had somehow erased recordings, key recordings, of a CD which he had been ordered by the court to disclose to us. And that the DPP's Vincent Dean and Garda Superintendent Joe McKenna, at the very least, were also in on the act. Now, this is called criminal damage and conspiracy to pervert justice. And it could land you or me in jail for life. But no matter who we brought the evidence to, no one in authority would respond to us. Not the judge, not the DPP's office, not the Garda Commissioner, and not even the High Court, where Justice Richard Humphreys somehow managed to fog and obfuscate his way to refusing three judicial review applications to have this ridiculous farce of a trial in Castlebar stopped in its tracks. The next bit of chicanery occurred in January this year, when they moved the court dates forwards by three days without informing us. And very conveniently, Judge McCarthy then found us guilty in our absence, even though I still had no legal representation and neither of us had even entered a defence. Again, all of this is so fundamentally unlawful as to beggar belief. But then again, this is Ireland, and we were in court basically because we had embarrassed the establishment. This was the only way they could stop the trial before we called scores of witnesses who would expose all of the lies because by now the prosecution had made a right pig's ear out of the proceedings and we had lodged criminal complaints naming Anus McCarthy, Vincent Dean, Peter Mooney and Joe McKenna for conspiring to pervert justice. But nothing was going to budge McCarthy from the agenda. And on January the 23rd he had me arrested off the train coming from the Supreme Court in Dublin and I was jailed overnight. The next morning he sentenced me to two months in prison. And remember, I still had no legal representation and we had entered no defence. In other words, it was all completely unlawful and everyone involved was fully aware of this. Colm had escaped this particular pantomime by being in hospital that day. Now there is one insidious development in all of this that needs to be specially highlighted because it undermines and exposes the oft-repeated lie of the so-called statutory independence of both the judiciary and of the DPP's office. Because by some amazing stroke of divinely inspired premonition, High Court Judge Richard Humphreys was able to somehow predict in a document he signed at midday January the 23rd that I would be pursuing circuit court proceedings the following day. But even I didn't know this at the time because I had yet to be arrested off the train and jailed overnight for supposedly missing uh, court that day. The whole setup stank to high heaven. And remember, we had already lodged papers in the Supreme Court naming all of these scoundrels and accusing them of criminal interference and failures of statutory duty, including a number of judges. The coincidental fact that DPP Claire Loftus had by then replaced Vincent Dean with her own Deputy Director of Superior Court Operations, again without any notification to us whatsoever, raises the stench of collusion even further. Why on earth would the Deputy Director of Superior Court Operations at the Office of the DPP be involved in a silly little podunk Section 6 public order offence in County Mayo? And why was he trying to hide his real title from us? The fact that our High Court and Supreme Court papers specifically mentioned the date of January the 26th and not January the 23rd for the continuation of the trial in documents that were being actively contested by the DPP's office at the very time that Raymond Briscoe was assigned to our case, this just raises far too many obvious questions. The added fact that Briscoe wrote us a threatening letter the day before we were scheduled to press common informer charges against Mooney, McKenna and Dean in Belmullet Court, and the fact that Judge Gerard Horton, who was supposed to be there that day, he was inexplicably reassigned elsewhere. That also reeks of official collusion and complicity. The plain fact of the matter is that this unannounced moving of court dates in January was a desperate attempt by the establishment to avoid the continuation of an increasingly ridiculous farce of a trial that was bringing shame, disgrace and embarrassment on the establishment. It was also without doubt a criminal conspiracy 
that involved elements of the court service, the DPP's office and the judiciary. And anyone who thinks otherwise should please just look at the facts and ask yourself why else then would the court service, the DPP's office and the judges concerned all point-blank refuse to give us access to the original DAR records even though we are entitled to them by law. So, on January the 24th, I was given the choice of going straight to jail or signing the appeal papers, which were conveniently already prepared for me. I really had no choice. The appeal was set for May the 2nd, and Judge Sean O'Donovan was specially brought in from Cork on the orders of Raymond Grork, the President of the Circuit Cork. Grork was the judge who had exited his courtroom smirking on February the 17th after refusing to sign my legal aid form. Peter Mooney also refused to accept two other applications, telling me curtly to take it up with the Department of Justice if you don't like it. By then I had made six formal applications for legal aid, and despite being granted it nine months earlier, still none had been assigned to me. The trial should not have even started without me having legal aid, and now we were in a forced and contrived appeal with me facing a prison sentence, with a special hard case judge brought in from outside to oversee proceedings, who smugly told me that I could have a solicitor if I brought one in myself, but that in the meantime the trial would continue regardless, in other words, uh, in my absence. I told him again it was the state's obligation to provide me with legal aid, but Judge O'Donovan seemed as unconcerned about human rights law as both McCarthy and Grork, and he just glared at me and barked, get on with it, now. Now, I won't bore you all with the intricate details, but basically we had two days of prosecution witnesses giving evidence. All of them were allowed to sit in the courtroom listening to each other's lies, even as we objected. O'Donovan kept interrupting me and dismissed witnesses before I'd even finished questioning them. He also point-blank refused to speak into the microphone for the record and basically did his best to bully the proceedings and personally intimidate me. After a day and a half of this, I stood up to him. He didn't like it. He stormed out, muttering something about not putting up with any more of this nonsense tomorrow. The next morning, I delivered a formal notice, which reminded the judge of his obligations to uphold the law and the Constitution and adhere to his solemn oath of office. He refused to accept it. He ordered me to continue my case. I asked him again to please speak into the microphone. He refused again and glowered at me. I told him I would not be intimidated and that he needed to speak into the microphone or recuse himself. I read out some common law legal authorities by Lord Denning that demonstrated that these proceedings were unlawful and therefore legally void. He responded by saying, we don't have much truck with English lords and ladies in the Republic of Cork. Eventually, visibly frustrated, he shuffled off to consult the law books and when he returned, he asked me if I was refusing to continue the trial. I said, no, absolutely not, Judge. I still have seven of eight witnesses to call. But these proceedings are completely unlawful, and you know it. And I will not knowingly be a party to unlawful or criminal conduct. Shortly afterwards, after some seemingly confused uh, exchanges between the DPP's lawyers, lawyers and the judge, O'Donovan declared, your appeal is denied and then he walked out to sign his name to a fraudulent order that stated that he had heard a uh, full trial. He had not. He hadn't even properly heard half the trial. And as the eminent Justice Humphreys has repeatedly told us, you simply can't stop a trial midway. Oh, really, Judge? The committal order from Anus McCarthy was also counterfeit, in that it states that it is a true copy of the original, but it isn't. It isn't even signed by Anus McCarthy. A clerk has printed his name on it instead. One wonders if this has anything to do with the fact that Judge Anus McCarthy retired from his duties the day before I was due to be released from prison. Whatever the reason, he probably didn't go a day too soon. So, I was handcuffed and taken to prison, unlawfully, on foot of flawed and misleading papers. Three legitimate habeas corpus applications were then inexplicably refused by the High Court, and a whole raft of peculiarities such as missing or backdated documents, unanswered letters to the authorities, people turned away from the prison because I supposedly had legal aid, which I hadn't, that was another contrivance. This all ensured that our efforts to address matters in a timely manner were thwarted.
So, we contacted the Irish branch of Transparency International to inform them of my unlawful trial and false imprisonment, only to find out that their supposedly independent legal department is actually funded by our Department of Justice. Then, we contacted the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, who has a board of 15 members appointed by the government, whose declared mission is, quote, to promote and protect human rights and equality in Ireland, close quotes. They wrote back six weeks later, saying that, even though Ireland is bound by international human rights law, that, unfortunately, no mechanism exists in the domestic framework to enforce this. And even though their website clearly states that they have the power to give legal help and support, they simply thanked me for my interest in the Commission and regretted that they could be of no further assistance. Meanwhile, in the criminal case against the four Dublin Gardaí, the DPP's office had been directed by Judge Conal Gibbons to gather the evidence and return to him on May 11th with a decision. But the DPP's office did not contact me. And as far as I know, that case has simply disappeared off the books while I was in prison. It's been done without any notice to me whatsoever, and with the DPP and the court service still refusing to answer any of our questions. I did, however, receive my Garda records. Those arrived in the post last week, six months after I applied for them. It is supposed to take six weeks. As expected, anything of interest or value has been blackened out, and I now appear to have a criminal rap sheet that contains over 70 entries. Now, this has gone from zero to 70 in a matter of three or four years. Most of those entries are either unproven allegations or pure fiction. What is interesting, though, is that the Gardaí have somehow come into possession of private letters that we sent to various authority figures, as well as the apparent disappearance of many of the formal complaints we made. Whatever the contrived explanation may be, the fact is that none of our complaints to or about Gardaí have resulted in any results. But false allegations against me and others do get acted upon, as you can see. Go figure. As for our applications to the Supreme Court, there were two of them. One was about the fact that seven judges in a row had refused to act on legitimate common informer applications, which is in violation of the law and of superior court rulings. The other concerned the proofs of criminality at Casabar Courthouse and the unlawfulness of the trial. Both applications complained that Judge Richard Humphreys seemed more inclined to avoid the issues instead of properly dealing with them under judicial review. After months and months of being messed about by the court service, we finally received an email last week advising us that the Supreme Court, first of all, didn't find that the issue of judges running out of their courts without any explanation, or that of state agents indulging in blatant criminality were matters of sufficient general importance or that it was in the public interest of justice to grant an appeal to the Supreme Court. In short, we haven't been allowed to make an appeal. The fact that my application papers were then stamped do not publish on the website does seem to be a bit of a giveaway though. The day before yesterday, two Gardaí came to our house to inform me that Peter Mooney, the man at the heart of the wrongdoing in Castlebar Courthouse, who has no problem whatsoever lying under oath, altering documents, changing court dates and erasing evidence, that he has made a complaint to Gardaí that nearly six months ago he felt threatened during an exchange with me at Castlebar Courthouse. Apparently, he has CCT footage of us talking to him at the court service counter but he has no audio. He wasn't aware, it seems, that we had recorded everything. An application for legal aid may be made to the court either in person, which I did tw twice now, by the applicant's legal representative, which I don't have, or by letter to the court registrar, which I've just done. And I, I, I have no power, nor has any power to grant you that. It says it clearly, by letter to the court registrar. Well, I suggest you might want to take that with the Department of Justice. With the Department of Justice. Peter, you know what? You've just been in to see Raymond Grok, haven't you? I just want to confirm that I was right. You want to see... Well, can I go and see him now then, please? No, he, he said he won't think about the matter. Gardaí have asked me if I wanted to make a statement. I declined. Other than to suggest that if Mr Mooney intends continuing his career as a serial liar and a psychophant, then he probably needs to work on his sensitivities. Either that, or he should go join a gym. 
Please pay attention to what's going on, folks. This is not an occasional breach of justice, an occasional act of wrongdoing by the authorities. This indicates deliberate, systemic, orchestrated, industrial-scale corruption and law-breaking by the people that are being paid to look after us. It simply can't be allowed to continue. And the only way we can help each other is by supporting each other and making sure that when we get into these difficulties, that we are there to help and assist each other. And for that, I thank you all, those who have supported us uh, in our difficult times recently. And by the way, we are still seeking legal assistance for our cases against the state.